I'm very pleased to see you all this morning. And I don't know actually whether I would speak for 45 minutes. <laughs> uh, let me talk as long as I can. And then probably I will stop and then you may ask me questions. So we can have a discussion after that. As uh, Eileen mentioned, uh, the topic of my talk today is uh, a misconception of uh, metta practice. Metta is translated into English as uh, loving kindness, which I disagree with because of the very uh, meaning of the word, Pali word, metta, doesn't convey the, the same uh, way when we say uh, loving kindness. Metta comes from the Pali word mitta, Sanskrit mitra. Metta, mitra means uh, friend in Sanskrit. So the Sanskrit form is maitri. Pali form is met mitta, also means friends. And the Pali form is metta. Therefore, maitri or mitta means friendliness. Friendliness. So I would translate this word metta, friendliness. It is very easy for us to be friendly, isn't it? Rather than thinking of loving kindness. When we meet somebody, should we feel loving kindness or should we feel friendliness? We feel friendliness. We feel friendly. We say so and so is friendly. So, metta really means friendliness. In order to make it even, uh, it sounds uh, uh, more uh, altruistic, we might say loving friendliness. That is the proper word. Second word is karuna. Karuna means kindness. If you say loving kindness and then kindness again, it is a redundant repetition. And therefore metta must be friendliness, karuna must be kindness. Third is mudita, appreciate your joy. And the fourth is uh, upekka, uh, equanimity. These are the four Brahma Viharas. Keeping this meaning in mind, I like to spend few minutes explaining how we practice uh, metta and how people have misunderstood the meaning, not only the meaning, but the results, practice of metta. There are eight ways of practicing metta. One is uh, asevana. Asevana means associating. Associating with the thought of metta. Living friendliness, we have to develop in our mind and we must keep associating with that word, with, that, with the meaning of friendliness. How can I be friendly when I meet somebody in the morning? It would be I who say first, good morning. I don't wait till somebody else tells me good morning. If I practice metta, I will be the one to
to say metta, good morning first in the morning. That is how I associate the word metta in my mind. This is called association. Then bhavana, asevana, bhavana, bhavana, as you all know, is repeatedly practicing. Do it every single day. In the Metta Sutta, you say, sitting, standing, walking, lying down, whenever awake, you practice Metta. Normally, people practice Metta only on sitting on a cushion. <laughs> uh, once, we get, what they, once they get out, they would say, I can practice Metta for everybody, but not the cockroaches. <laughs> I have no Metta for cockroaches. I can practice metta for everybody, but not so to so and so. I hate so and so. That is not the metta practice. Metta practice is the, the thought we keep developing, cultivating, repeatedly practicing in our mind. Repeat in the mind. That is the second. Asevana bhavana bahuli karana. Bahuli karan means cultivate, multiply it. You know, when we repeat certain things over and over again, that becomes, that becomes stronger, the powerful. Then, uh, bhavana, uh, asevana, bhavana, bahuli karan, yani katha. Yani katha means making it a vehicle, just like a vehicle in our mind keep the metta thought all the time and ride on metta thought in the, to be very uh, simple. Vattu kataya, vattu means uh, property. Make it the mental property, metta practice. Anuttitaya, don't get out of it. You stay with that. Susamaraddha start with correctly, properly, meaning there are very many ways of practicing it. Either to practice metta towards six directions or ten directions, or practice metta to spreading from oneself, expand the space, the area we practice. Now, when such a person, when a person practices metta like that, then we all perhaps uh, have heard that there are benefits, 11 benefits. I think you all have heard them. Misunderstanding arising, uh, arises from the benefits. Let me list the benefits first. And then I try to start talking about misunderstanding. What are the benefits? Sleep well. Metta practitioners practice, can sleep well. And get up well. When you sleep well, you can get up easily, comfortably, without feeling uh, grumpy, grouchy in the morning. Then in between sleep and getting up, there will not be nightmares. Whatever dreams you have will be pleasant, meaningful uh, dreams. Then the person who practices metta will be pleasing to living all uh, human beings. Human beings. Because the facial expression is very clear. Will be pleasing to non-human beings, animals, ghosts, goblins, and so on. Metta practitioners will be protected by deities because they also love metta, friendliness. Then, metta practitioners will not be affected by fire, poison, and weapon. This is where the misunderstanding arises. Let me finish the list. 
the face becomes very clear, pleasant. When the person passes away, the person will pass, pa pass away without confusion, with very clear state of mind. If the person has not attained higher level of attainment like uh, stream entry and, or jhana and so on, the person will be free born in Brahma realms. These are the benefits. Now, many people think when they practice metta, they are, they can, uh, uh, they will not be affected by fire, poison and weapon. That is one of, that is, three of these benefits. Do you think, while you are practicing metta, somebody comes behind and uh, stab you, doesn't the blade of the knife go through your body? Suppose somebody shoot while you are practicing metta, doesn't the bullet go through your body? Suppose somebody gives you a piece of cake with poison in it, and you eat the cake while practicing metta, uh, doesn't the poison go into your body? Suppose while you are practicing metta, close eyes, close doors, and somebody comes closely, uh, close to you, and slowly set fire to your seat. Won't you be burnt? You will. <clears throat> now there are stories. When I tell you the story, you can, the meaning will be very clear. There was a, a king called uh, Udena. Uh, one day when the, the Buddha was uh, uh, meditating under a tree, uh, there, there was a, there was a woman, very young, pretty woman. Her name was Magandhya. Magandhya. And she was so pretty, so beautiful, that whenever somebody uh, proposed her to marry, she would reject him, saying something or other, some kind of force in him, Either he is short or dark or tall or fat or, you know, doesn't look nice and so forth. She would forget. As time passes, passed by, she of course was not getting younger every day. <laughs> so her parents began to worry and they are looking for a suitable man. So one day, her father was walking through a forest and then saw a very handsome person sitting under a tree, very serene, majestic looking, handsome young person. And he uh, immediately went on thought that this must be a suitable son-in-law for my daughter, husband for my daughter. So went home and called her wife and said, Darling, I found a very handsome man. I am pretty sure my daughter, our daughter, would like him very much. Come. So he brought her and the daughter and showed to this person. Who is this person? The Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> and introduced to him Sir, this is my daughter, 
Isn't she beautiful? Won't you like to marry her? Then Buddha said, uh, even having seen Tanha Rati Raga, three divine uh, names, there wasn't a scrapple of lust in my mind. How could I be marrying this human woman? He used much harsher words, but I don't use those words now. <laughs> So Magandhya got so upset because she was insulted and she conceived grudge. She wanted to hurt the Buddha, but she could not hurt the Buddha. Then she thought of hurting somebody who helped the Buddha, to hurt the Buddha. Who was that? This king in the... In the in that country, in India, there was a king called Udayana. He had a, a wife called Sama, Samavati, who was practicing metta. She was not only practicing metta, but having a metta retreat once a week. 500 women attended that retreat. So she was practicing metta, and teaching metta meditation to 500 other women. And the Buddha mentioned in Anguttara Nikaya, Etadaggam bhikkhe mama gihi upasikana metta, metta vihari nang yadidang samavati. Because among my lay female disciples, the number one practicing metta is Samavati. Samavati is number one. So she got the Buddha's own recognition for metta practicing. Now, Magandhya thought somehow she would marry King Udena and become his second wife. Kings, of course, those days had uh, many wives, like the Muslims. Uh, so she somehow managed to marry King Udayana. Now she lived in the same uh, campus, where the king's palace campus. Then she thought of uh, hurting Samavati, who was number one metta practitioner. So she did a lot of plots. There are many, many uh, sub-stories related to how she uh, tried to uh, kill Samavati. So finally, one day she decided when Samavati was practicing metta, teaching metta to 500 uh, other women in a large hall, Magandhya got her own people and uh, pour oil around the building and set fire to the building. All the 500 women along with Samavati, while practicing metta, were burned to death in that fire. So, when you practice metta, according to the discourse, fire will not affect you. Now, here is a story of 500 women perishing in fire while practicing metta. So, does that mean the Buddha's words were incorrect? Buddha did not, Buddha's words were not true?
there are some other stories as well. This is a very famous story. So, friends, if you believe that when you practice metta, fire, poison, weapon will not affect you, then uh, how can this 500 women perished in fire? What it really, when, when they were dying, Samavati said loudly, Sisters, sisters, this is the time for us to practice metta. Don't let your mind, your, your body will be perished, you all will die, but don't let your metta be affected. What does it mean? Fire, poison, weapon are figurative, not literal. There is a discourse in the I mentioned these discourses for all of you to, since you are studying Buddhism, to go to them and study these sutras to understand the meaning of Buddha's words. Aditya Pariyaya Sutra. You can find it in our Vandana book, our Vandana book, Aditya Pariyaya Sutra. In that sutra, in this discourse, Buddha said, because eyes are on fire, visual objects are on fire, eye consciousness is on fire, eye contact is on fire. The feeling that arises depending on eye contact also is on fire. With what fire? Fire of greed, fire of hatred, fire of delusion. When you practice metta, fire of hatred will not arise in your mind. Because hatred and metta will not go together. When you practice metta, it is the hatred that fades away. It is the hatred that will not affect you. How can hatred affect you? when you practice metta. And also poison. Raga visa, dosa visa, moha visa. Poison is greed, hatred and delusion. When we practice metta, greed will not affect our mind. Hatred will not affect our mind. Confusion will not affect our, affect our mind. Similarly, satta, satta means weapon, weapon. Raga satta, dosa satta, moha satta. Raga, weapon, greed, weapon of greed, weapon of hatred, weapon of delusion will not affect our mind. Metta and greed are enemies. Metta and greed. Greed is the near enemy of metta. Why is that? Greed disguises and arise in our mind as metta. So it is very easy for people to confuse greed with metta. And therefore, met greed is not a, f a friend of metta, greed is enemy of metta. Similarly, hatred is a far enemy, 
Greed is ne enemy, ne enemy you cannot see. It is hiding in yourself. Far enemy you can see coming from distance. Anger or hatred we can see arising in our mind. So, when we practice metta, greed will not arise in our mind at that time. Hatred will not arise in our mind at that time. At the time we practice metta, during the time we practice metta, it is that during the time we practice metta, greed will not affect our mind, hatred will not affect our mind, confusion will not affect our mind. Also this metta practice, even in Karaniya Metta Sutta, Buddha asked us to practice metta just like a mother who has, who protects her only child even at the risk of her own life. Can we do that? Can really, literally, can we practice metta just like a mother protecting her only child even at the risk of her own life? Can we do that? It is not possible. It is not possible. I mean, when you practice metta, you can see how difficult it is. How can we practice metta towards all living beings? There are more than seven billion beings, human at least, human beings, and many trillions of non-humans, animals, fish, snakes, and so on. How can each of them, how can we practice metta and protect each of them even at the risk of our own life, just like a mother protecting her only child, even at the risk of her own life, can we do that? We cannot do that. Does this mean Buddha said something that asks us to do something that we cannot do? Buddha said, because I never ask you to do anything I never ask you to do anything that you cannot do. If that is so, when he asks us to practice metta just like a mother, protecting her only child, even at the risk of her own life, did he ask us to do something that we cannot do? No, friends. <clears throat> what it means is that the metta thought we protect. It is the metta thought. It is the metta thought that we protect, not that all living beings we are going to protect. We cannot do that. While Buddha was teaching metta, a man was killing pigs behind the monastery, Jayatavana monastery. 55 years he was killing pigs. Wars were going on all over the world. People are fighting all over the world. Buddha could not stop them. But Buddha could practice metta and protect the metta taught in his mind. Friends, when we practice metta, it is the metta practitioners who are protected. Metta practitioners cannot go pro out and protect all other living beings. It is impossible. When you practice metta, when you practice mindfulness, for instance, when you practice mindfulness, you are not practicing it for me. <laughs> you are practicing it for you. Just like when you eat, you eat for your own appetite, your hunger, hunger, not for me. Similarly, when we practice, each and every one of us, protect our metta thought, it is not difficult for us to think 
may all beings be well and happy. With one sentence is enough. If we keep repeating it in our mind, it is our mind that becomes peaceful. It is our mind that becomes calm, relaxed, free from greed, free from hatred, free from delusion at that moment. And therefore, we must understand the practical aspect of metta practice. We cannot be foolish thinking that since I am practicing metta, I can put my hand into the tiger's mouth. <laughs> you cannot do that. I cannot get a snake come and bite me if it is a venomous snake. I remember somebody in a certain country uh, has heard that there was a monk practicing metta and he thought he, there was a, the, the, story, the rumor that the so and so monk was practicing, I don't want to mention the country and the name and so forth because it might be scandalous. <laughs> I simply want to tell you the incident. And this monk was known for metta practice. So people began to build up all kinds of stories. This is how mere hearsay stories builds up. They don't know anything. They heard a little bit and then build up various stories upon that. So this monk was practicing metta and the story was that elephants come and kneel down before him and worship the monk and go away. Tigers come and kneel down and so forth because he was practicing metta. So one, can, one uh, newspaper wanted to publish this. A reporter went with the camera and monk was there and his reporter was waiting, waiting, waiting and then uh, they heard some sound and then monk went towards that. It was a thick jungle. Sure enough, there was an elephant and uh, monk went. He was practicing metta. He went. Cameraman was ready with the camera because he wanted to take a picture when the elephant knelt before him. Sure, elephant came, the monk went, elephant simply grabbed him and crushed him. So he, came, he, he you know, took a photograph of that and published in the newspaper. You see? The, the rumor was that when his, his, since he was practicing metta, elephant came and knelt before him. But this time, elephant came and crushed him and killed him. So, don't believe in mere hearsay. Don't believe in all kinds of superstitious stories about metta. There is no magical power in metta. No magic. But those who practice metta very sincerely will have a peaceful mind. Each and every one of you, if you practice metta, it is your mind that becomes calm, relaxed, peaceful, can sleep well, you appear relaxed, and your health will be good and so forth because you don't poison your mind. You don't poison your mind by greed, hatred and delusion. So, <clears throat> protect your own metta thought even at the risk of your own life. That means when Samavati and 500 women were dying in fire, what Samavati told them, sisters, this is the time that you should not let anger enter your mind. This is the time you should keep your friendly feeling, friendly thought towards the one who set fire to the building to kill us. 
That is how metta protects your mind from fire of hatred, fire of greed, fire of poison. Poison is greed, hatred, delusion. Fire is po greed, hatred, delusion. Weapon is greed, hatred, delusion. Buddha said, when we use very harsh words to attack somebody, it is called in Pali, Mukha Satyena Vitudeti. Mukha Satya means weapon. Mukha Satya means verbal weapon, verbal dagger. Using verbal dagger, you stab people that will go through their marrow into the bone. You see, through the bone, go into the marrow. Words are so harsh, so strong, so powerful that they can pierce your heart. And that is called weapon of hatred. When we practice metta, that kind of thought will not arise in our mind. That kind of thought, even if somebody aims at us, will not affect our minds. Because our minds are full of metta. Only when we practice it, each and every one of us in our own mind feel the peace, calm, relaxed state. So, <clears throat> I think uh, uh, there are many stories to all about to talk, to tell about it, but I think uh, this may be enough for today's talk. And uh, probably, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Any questions? Oh, the first one. Hands yeah. up very fast. Mm -hmm. uh, Bhante, uh, if everything is arising because it's dependent of cause and condition, what the cause and condition of fear? Of? Oh. Fear. 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 Okay. Thank you. Uh, Causes of fear is ignorance. You don't know. You don't know why you have fear. Darkness or some kind of unknown things uh, people imagine. Um, when we uh, very, uh, with a clear state of mind, try to inquire, question uh, the reason of fear, we will say there is no particular reason. I tell you, when uh, Siddhartha Gautam was practicing meditation in the forest, there is a discourse called Bhaya Bhairava Sutta in Majjhima Nikaya. When he practiced in, metta, med uh, practiced in med uh, meditation, on uh, new moon night, new moon night means night with pitch dark, not even stars shining. In such a cloudy, dark night, he was practicing it. All of a sudden he heard a noise. People think when, uh, when there is, uh, the night is very, very dark, no, nothing you can see, so you have eerie feeling <laughs> in a forest. That is the time all the Ghosts come out of the <laughs> from underground, <laughs> and so uh, your hair stands on ends. You have goosebumps all over your body. So when he was meditating in such a situation, all of a sudden he had a big sound, big sound. Listen. Other people would run away from the sound. But he ran into the sound. He went to the 
the, the direction from where the sound came. He thought, there must be something. And he went there. What he saw was a peacock sat on a dry branch. The branch broke and fell down. <laughs> that was the sound. So, he was not afraid. No fear arose, arose in his mind. Why? He was inquisitive. He wanted to find out the cause, the reason. Other persons who have not developed their mind like that would run away and have uh, nervous tension, anxiety, worry, and so on and so forth. So, fear arises mostly from unknown, uh, un not knowing something. That is called ignorance, from ignorance. How to solve it? Okay. Ignorant, the opposite of ignorance is wisdom. Wisdom arises from inquiry, questioning, asking. They're trying to find out the cause of uh, whatever uh, fear we have. So, to overcome that, without any uh, worries, tension, with a strong mind, try to inquire. Then, or, when the fear arises, you uh, surrender to fear. Let the fear overwhelm you and stay with it. It'll be, you may have a terrible feeling. And after that, you may even perspire, you may even uh, be feel very, very bad, and it will disappear, because there is no particular reason. <coughs> Next question. Okay, before. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Hello, Pante. Thank you for your talk on clarifying mis our misunderstanding of metta. I personally have uh, read some stories on the Buddha and there was a story of Devadatta putting a crazy elephant, Nalagiri, and the elephant wanted to you know, go on a rampage and then the Buddha used metta to calm down the elephant. Is that a fairy tale? And as other monks that have um, forest tradition monks, that go meditation in the forest and there's always stories of snakes and wild boars and animals and poisonous things and they use metta to protect themselves. Also, is that, is that uh, exaggeration or can we trust? Now, <clears throat> I know these stories, uh, I'm not uh, unaware of the Buddha's uh, story of Nalagiri and uh, that story also is not uh, uh, false, it is true. We find in uh, Pali literature. Now what happened was when uh, Buddha's metta was so strong, so powerful, in his mind there was no fear whatsoever. Uh, therefore, at that moment, in his, from his body, uh, emanated very peaceful radiance. And that, uh, he made him calm, relaxed and peaceful. And uh, that metta arose in the Buddha's mind in such a strong way that uh, Buddha was able to remain calm, relaxed 
and peaceful. And uh, the Nala Giri, at that time, uh, felt the Buddha's metta. Now, that is not the kind of metta that everybody else can practice. Buddha was fully enlightened. Now, we are talking about the metta, ordinary metta. <laughs> Buddha's mind was 100% pure from all other defilements, completely destroyed. And therefore, his mind, we cannot compare with the mind of ordinary people who practice metta. In their case, in our ordinary people's metta is not that strong, that powerful. And therefore, we cannot expect the same results <laughs> from our metta practice. And uh, it is uh, other ordinary monks who are practicing in, in forests uh, don't have that kind of metta that kind of power. That is why that particular monk who was known for practicing metta was crushed by the elephant. Because the mind was not that 100% uh, perfect or pure. Thank you, Bhante. Yeah. Next question. Morning, Bhante. Thank you for your talk. Uh, you mentioned just now that uh, metta can sometimes be confused with the near enemy, uh, greed. Uh, can you please further explain maybe an example and how do we overcome that? Or know, how, how do we differentiate that? You know, near enemy is a desire. Uh, perhaps... Uh, it is very easy for people to practice metta to their loved ones. Loved ones simply means attachment to somebody. Attachment to somebody. Some people, these are, not, these are very common thing. I mean, nobody should be, uh, should take it, uh, you know, a personal... Uh, uh, you know, criticism. Uh, this is very normal, ordinary. This is ordinary people's state of mind. Uh, as I mentioned, <coughs> they are not uh, perfectly enlightened. Therefore, when they start practicing metta, they say, I practice metta to my wife, my husband, my parents, my brothers, my sisters, my children. Any time you think of mother, brother, pra father, husband, wife, and so forth, what first comes to your mind? Your attachment. You are really, literally attached to your loved ones. Attachment itself is completely opposite of metta. Metta is a universal practice. When we practice metta, there are no faces. No faces. All living, breathing beings are there in the universe. There are billions and trillions of beings all over the universe. We don't see them, we don't know them. We don't see their shape, size, color, and nothing we know. We know only very few beings, human and so on, that we have seen, no associated. Other than that, there are many trillions of unknown beings. So when we practice metta, close our eyes, then you don't see anybody, or even open your eyes, and still you may see only very few, you cultivate the thought in the mind that there are living beings. Just like these beings, there are many, many, many living beings. I wish, I wish all these beings be well, happy, and peaceful. 
that way my i i don't pick one or few uh, particular individuals whom i love very much when we pick and choose few then what about others what about others when you say i love my husband my wife my children then what about the husbands and wife or others and those who are not even husbands and wives and other beings and therefore this is called universal practice in this universal practice what we cultivate is the thought in the mind thought in the mind it is very easy to have thought whether sitting standing walking lying down <coughs> metta practice actually <coughs> is not limited to one situation in our talks we can practice metta talk while we are talking how say don't say anything to hurt somebody attack somebody intentionally or unintentionally when we do things do almost anonymously i tell you very simple practices when i go to public bathrooms i do that public bathrooms when i go there if there is water on the floor if there are paper towels or something i clean it if the toilet the uh, commode is dirty i clean it when i finish i clean the whole area it takes few minutes and come out why i know when the next person goes seeing clean toilet that person would be happy i want that person to have that little happiness that is metta practice i don't know who will go there but i do this very little thing people do you don't know perhaps unintentionally you do trillions of things to help people help living beings not dirtying the road not putting things to make the road dirty and so forth and so on so many things you all do do them intentionally to make it a metta practice may so and so after me be happy while eating this little food let the bird be happy you give something with metta and generous thought like that when we practice metta we eliminate all our attachment clinging craving It's just with pure clean heart we do that that is why we say when we particularize pick and choose then we preclude so many other beings <clears throat> thank you bante behind anyone uh bante uh trying to understand how to actually practice uh, metta meditation towards oneself uh sometimes we could uh, express love for others but sometimes it could be very difficult to love oneself and also follow up the second question is if we were to do the metta meditation towards oneself how we actually not fall into the trap of the attachment like just now you mentioned because we are so attached to ourselves when you practice metta towards yourself how what to ourselves yes and how we not fall into the trap of getting into the trap of attachment how we to we do not attach to ourselves yeah. yeah 
I think the uh, first part of the question is what? How to practice metta to towards ourselves. To ourself. And uh, how to practice metta towards ourselves and how not to have attachment to ourselves when we practice metta. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> when we practice metta to ourselves, in the, first place, in the first place, we understand what, how we do practice uh, mindfulness. In the mindfulness meditation, it's a very beautiful system. Everything is connected. In Mahasatipatthana, uh, we begin to practice mindfulness without attachment. Practice mindfulness without attachment. Uh, practice mindfulness without hatred. Abhijja uh, domana, vinaya loke abhijja domana These are the uh, phrases used in Satipatthana Sutta. Kaya kaya nupasi virati atapi sampajanu satima vinaya loke abhijja domana Be mindful without becoming attached to the body or feeling or perception or hatred towards oneself without attachment and hatred. How? This body, feeling, perception, thoughts and consciousness are always in a state of flux. Literally that is true although we are not aware of it, this body, feeling, perception, thoughts and consciousness are always changing. Always changing. In this changing, uh, what you call aggregates, there is no moment to stop and hold, grab. Why? Any attempt we make to hold is a futile, because nothing will stop. Things are changing, 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 changing. And therefore, the, um, uh, what do you call, anger or hate has no place to stay. It also is subject to change, disappears. Similarly, there is no moment to hold on to anything, clinging to anything, because they are always changing. So mindfulness is extremely important to practice metta. Or metta, when we practice metta, it should be cultivated with or combined with mindfulness. That is why in, Mang, in uh, uh, Karaniya Metta Sutta, I wish you all know the sutras very well. Karaniya Metta Sutta, Buddha said, Etang Satin Adityaya. Practice this mindfulness. Karaniya Metta Sutta is the Metta Meditation Sutra. It's called, translated into English as Metta, uh, Loving Friendliness Sutta, or Loving Kindness, as traditionally some people use. Loving Kindness Sutra. Karaniya Metta Sutta. In this loving friendliness or loving or metta sutta, Buddha says, practice this mindfulness. Talking about metta, he said, practice this mindfulness. What is this mindfulness? Metta practice. Metta practice should be practiced with mindfulness. What is mindfulness? That everything is impermanent. In this impermanent everything, there is no place or time to hold on to anything or cling to anything, grab anything. So when we practice metta towards oneself, one should see that even though I call myself, this so-called myself is a changing entity, continuously moving, Entity, the entity which is in a state of flux 
all the time. With this understanding, if you practice metta, there will not be any moment for you to develop attachment to yourself. Okay? Thank you, Bhante. I think that's all. Oh, one last question. Uh, I think time's up. Okay, last question. Bhante, in our daily lives, we actually do a lot of things that may harm other beings, such as in the process of cleaning our houses or even just washing our clothes. Um, we harm a lot of living beings. How do I reconcile that with my metta practice? You see, uh, in a way, when you go to any extreme, it would be very difficult to live. Even uh, when we wash our body, we kill many microbes. Every time we apply soap and wash our body, our skin, and clean the skin, we kill microbes. When we take uh, antibiotic, which I did for two weeks <laughs> when I had pneumonia, uh, I think many millions of uh, uh, bacteria, they are living beings, were killed. My intention, or doctor's intention, was not to kill any beings, but to, you know, get rid of this uh, harmful uh, bacteria from the body. So, uh, there are definitely many beings die while we are living. But our intention is not to kill all these beings. We even don't know they are. And therefore, it, it will not uh, uh, be hampered our metta practice. I mean, metta practice will not be hampered uh, uh, by uh, living or because we have no intention to kill all these beings. So long as we have no intention, uh, they happen, you know, f for instance, farmers, farmers cultivate uh, land uh, to feed vegetarians. Uh, when the vegetarians eat uh, vegetable uh, with good conscience, because they don't, uh, they have not killed anyone. But the farmers also don't have any intention to kill living beings when they are farming. Anyway, there are beings killed during the process of farming. Uh, so long as we have no particular intention of killing, uh, then we may not feel uh, guilty and we notice not difficult for us to practice metta. I think as Eileen mentioned, uh, this may be enough for this morning. Actually, I'm not 100% recovered from my pneumonia, and yet uh, strong enough to uh, spend these few minutes uh, talking and answering your questions. And uh, uh, thank you very much for your participation and listening to this Dhamma talk and encouraging me to talk and I wish you all peace, happiness and long life in good health. Same sadhu, sadhu, <coughs> sadhu. Let's uh, pay our respects to Bhante. And may we wish Bhante a long life, good health Thank and uh, uh, no more rebirths. <laughs> <laughs> Bhante, uh, can we just uh, uh, do uh, transfer merits? Uh, just idangmi nyatinang hotu. Okay. You. Okay. 